Well, just to give you a brief introduction, my name is Mario Rojas, and I appreciate you guys being here tonight. Um, I'm actually, as so of today, I'm still a senior at UTD, and in a week and a half, I'll be graduating and walking the stage, so. <laughs> accomplishment, and I'm really happy. Well, uh, just to give you a brief introduction of my project, um, this project uh, was part of a, a school project, actually, for my business analytics class. Um, one of the requirements was to do an R, but I decided to stick with my guns and, and go ahead and do it with Python. So here it is. Um, so it was, the theme was the oil, gas, the oil and the gas industry, and it was about electrical submersible pumps. So it, it's main, oh, if you guys don't know what they are, in the oil and gas industry, electric submersible pump systems are probably best known as the effective artificial lift method of pumping production fluids to the surface. In this case, oil. So here's a just a picture of how, how one looks like, and uh, don't, don't ask me how this works, because uh, I still, still haven't uh, researched that. So, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> so, if, if you're asking that question, there is a one minute video of how this EPS works. So here are all the components of the ESP system. Um, there's the motor. This is in uh, Brazil in uh, Portuguese, so. Here's the electrical signals being sent to the sensor. Little, uh, little black little bubbles, there's a bunch of money signs coming up. So for those people asking questions, uh, how it works, here's how it works. Um, so what this sensor does, it's, it, it brings back signals uh, of how the motor is working. So from this component, the, lo the, the electric motor has a ro rotatable mo rotor that is contained in stationary stator. When the motor operates, the, ro the rotor rotates, causing rotary vibrations of the ESP assembly to occur. And one thing I do want to highlight that the vibration of this motor is really a key uh, into uh, predicting if, uh, if this if this mo if this ESP is up or down. So, so for this project, I was asked to create a model that will predict this, when the sensor will be triggered up, down, or a warning message. So a failure of the ESP will in in a well can stop production, or even lead to the uh, a dangerous event. So here are some variable descriptions of the whole data set. First one will be the well ID. The second one is the field. So there's uh, two fields in this data set. What, one is called Sihan and one is called West, Safahi. And each field has their own blocks, running from A1 through D9. Each, uh, each uh, ESP has their own serial number. And all the ESPs have their own vendors. So there's three vendors in the data set. And uh, yeah, there's a depth of the well in feet. Bean, I have no clue what that is. <laughs> and the performance, that's the performance of the ESP system from low to high. And that's in one column. Uh, here's the data of the unit, the, that the unit was installed. Here's the... Um, here's the volume or percentage of water. So the daily flow states how profitable, profitable the well is. The daily flow the oil production in the barrel per day. So each, each ESP will have number of tickets of orders generated for this device. And here's the average maintenance cost, uh, uh, average maintenance cost monthly for that ESP. 
And here's the, what I want to predict. So the three status are running, warning, and down. There's, an, uh, uh, there's a percent of time of ESP that the ESP is running. So, and the daily production variance is the difference between forecasted production volume and an actual production volume. Each ESP has their own region, and all regions are all, all ESPs are in the U.S. And each ESP has a time, so the time that it was recorded, and now it's all in hour, minutes, and seconds. They all they all they all have the temperature intake, and intake and discharge pressure, the pump vibration, rate and radio and axial, the motor temperature, the motor resistance, the motor current, and the leak voltage. Here's a side note that I put on my for myself. I started researching more about this, and it seems that the pump a pump vibration can really affect the status of a pump going down or up. So you're just informing my libraries and learning the data. This is a really good uh, technique that I learned in the Various Academy to use your uh, notebook as a shell, as shell, as shell com use shell commands on your Jupyter notebook to just see what you're uploading first. One thing I did notice that there's a bunch of dots in between the columns and that. So I decided to change that to to, um, to underscores. So I changed all my column things with an underscore in between. And this uh, whole data set has about 61,000, almost 62,000, 62,000 rows and 26 columns. One thing I did want to recognize for Pandas is to recognize the date that it was installed. So I changed that and parsed it with the date time format. I also did that with the time. So then I hit up the score here analysis. I wanted to see how many per ESP, how many were down, I mean from per, per ESP I wanted to check the status of how many times it triggered down, running, or warning. So I converted that into a, a single data frame for so I can use it on, on Seaborn. And here's a nice graph that I saw on uh, um, on the C on the Seaborn website, where you have all that gallery selections, I decided to use one and put it on my tailor it to my own, and just emphasize on how many of, on the top ESPs that trigger warning. Then I wanted to emphasize of how many ESPs trigger down, so how many times they trigger down during the during the, throughout the day. And I wanted you to see a total of, of putting them together with warning and down per ESP, and just showing you which one triggered the most um, bad signal. Then I wanted to dig a little deeper, so I decided to take the mean of the x variables and the team of the, the mean of the y variables and select all the rows. So and I divided it into into above the mean. Uh, is high vibration and uh, below the mean is low vibration, and I did see a, a quite a big, a lot of difference. I saw that the one with the high vibration had more warnings, more downs, and less running status, while the ones in low vibration uh, had a had a bunch of running and quite a little bit of down and and and, uh, and warning. So uh, this is just the, just to show you some other different ones I made just. I wanted to see like for so this so all this one for here are the ones that are running. As you can see, you can already question yourself. Well, it seems like the ones they're investing a lot of money on the ones that are, are uh, already running. So why making those big investments in there? We can just maybe replace it and, and use that money and allocate it to the ones that are actually trigger, triggering down and warning. As you can see, there's already about seventy seventy seven thousand five hundred thousand dollars. Uh, being invested on, on the ones that are, that are triggering down in, in a warning. So Mario, how do you generate this chart? I generate this chart using R, so you know, to satisfy my professor. <laughs> <laughs> I did this with R and I used a DD plot. Okay. So with the data wrangling, I just wanted to check which uh, how many nulls I had in the, in the data set. There was about 100 nulls in region and 200 nulls in TIC. So for um, I, this probably wouldn't made a big difference in my data, but I just decided to fill it up anyways, which I filled up uh, all of them with US. 
and with the TTIC, well, from this I noticed that all the columns had um, had the same value from the top bottom, from the from the top row and the bottom row. So all I did was a forward fill method using pandas. and I fill all my nulls. The next step was just to check for outliers in the data set, so I decided to plug all the numeric values into one big graph here. And I did notice a lot of outliers here in the average maintenance cost, TIC, the PICA, all this, uh, all this uh, columns here. And one thing I wanted to check, well, were this outliers part of, part of the data set or are this outliers were an error in the data set? So I did notice that there were about 60 ESPs that trigger for each outlier, so I decided to classify them as part of the data and I decided to keep them there. <coughs> for X and Y, for the X and Y variables, I did see a lot of outliers as well. Um, I also looked into the data and, and about 100 ESPs trigger that, that X and Y variables. So I decided to keep that as part of the data set and, and leave it there. So these are my data transformations. I wanted to check the date installation and I wanted to count the date. I mean the, the age of it. So with this programming, so uh, some using some um, what I do here. Oh, this is definitely a code that I uh, I saw in Stack Overflow. So thank you, Stack Overflow. Uh, let me try to expand this a little more. Uh, how does he make it bigger? Okay, he's got it. <clears throat> yeah, that's better. Thanks. So I decided to add a, the age of, <clears throat> of, of that pump. Another variable that I decided to use was the performance difference. Remember how I told you that one column was the whole performance? So I decided to turn that column into a string and just select the the um, the first four and the last four uh, characters, and from there I decided to uh, make the calculation and and and, and do the, the high minus the low. And then I decided to add dummies to the data frame, knowing that field were two, and so field and, and vendor I decided to change to do dummies for them. One thing I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do dummies on the block because both uh, fields had had the same block, so I couldn't make any, you know, and I couldn't see which on which block on or to which block it belonged to the, which field it belonged to the block. And for the two, for uh, I decided to do the binary uh, encoder for for the labels, so I decided to do I wanted to initial. Uh, approach was to see uh, put zero as down and warning put zero for warning and down and one for running and then down zero and then have zero for down one for warning and two for running just to uh, check the difference of of the models that I'm, I'm about to create so I decided to, with this column just showing how to save it to this S S V C S B. To, to do analysis in R. So here's the fun part, the logistic regression model. So for my um, logistic regression model, I decided to put all these columns in my features. And I decided to use the one with the two labels, which is down zero, warning zero, and running is one. I did my, tra I did my train test split. So one thing I did here is that I, I decided to scale my data with a, with a, a function called robust scaling. Because if you use the, the normal one, you, you'll probably get a lot of errors in your data. One thing is that uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm making emphasis that making sure that each feature has approximately the same scale can be crucial a pre-processing step, pre step. When there's outliers, it is best practice to use scalar that is robust, robust against outliers. And whenever I created my model, one thing that was really crucial was to add the class weight equaling balance. Because 
at first I ran my model and it was predicting at 90, 91, 91%. And, but the thing is that whenever I did my, uh, my matrix, it was predicting most of the, of the true values, so, so all the true positive values. And not much of the, well, pretty much nothing from the, uh, the true negatives. So that was really important to put class weight as balance because of my imbalance classes. So Mario, I remember you were using a different package too, right? Yes, so I wanted to, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you know right after my, okay. my model. Right. So with this model, um, so the way I interpreted this coefficient is that Bender 2 made a big impact on predicting 1. Bender and Bean and the and the and the top three that predicted that that were able to predict zero were the the vibration of B X and B Y and the bender and the third bender. So here I did my accuracy accuracy score for for such uh, for the model. And due to our classes being imbalanced, we couldn't rely on the model with the best classific classification accuracy. So here I predicted about 1,367 uh, as, as 0 and 7,000 as, as 1. So here the, the sensitivity is a measure used to report how effective a test is in identifying an ESP uh, with the running status. So the higher sensitivity is better. And same goes with the, with the specificity, just with the identifying the ESPs are warnings and downs. The higher specificity, the better. To use calculating both. So I wanted to do a classification report because looking at the confusion matrix, precision, recall, F1 score, and RT curve gave me gave me more insight into the accuracy of the model. So in this case, the best models, well, overall the best models should have both high precision and recall values. However, there is, off, there is often a trade-off between the two. Determining which matrix to optimize depends on the question being answered. In this case, the company wishes to find ESPs that may have a status of down, uh, down warning. So for this business case, recall should be really important. A missed down warning status is much more harmful to the company, which can cause downtime or a catastrophic event. In statistical terminology, this means that a false negative is more damaging than a false positive. Here's the frequency of the, of the probability of ESP running. And here's my ROC curve <coughs> that I, for the model. So seeing the ROC curve can help you choose the threshold that balances sensitivity and, specif and specificity in a way that makes sense for a particular context. So choosing the classification threshold is a business decision. So here I just wanted to change the threshold to see how much it, how much difference it will make. So I decided to change it to 54 just to see how what difference it will make. And it seems that it predicted. So my original matrix showed about 1,367 as true negatives, um, and see a big increase about 100. So here's the new sensitivity and the specificity. So next, I decided to do a random forest model just to see a difference between the two. Okay. Yes, question. Uh, already logistic regression has like threshold of 0.5, right? So you just use like 0.54. Yeah, as it, as as point, just to see how what the oh, difference okay. would be. So did you curious. try like lower or high, like 0 0.2? Yeah, so I, I decided to do a uh, higher. So the one, it's 50, so I decided to, to change to 54 to okay. see how what big difference it will make on the on the true positives. And it, and, and it definitely did a lot of, uh, didn't. yeah. So that, that's when I decided to just do, different, do a different model and see what, uh, how it would perform better. I wanted to do a decision tree at first, but a decision tree, one of the big disadvantages is that you can easily overfit. So I decided to do, go stick with the random force. Um, I used the same, same columns. Um, same train test to split, uh, and I, I did my F1 score instead of the accuracy score, and it was a 79. 
The accuracy so score did improve by, by one point. So here I see a big increase of, of 70, uh, 70 for sensitivity and 70 for uh, specificity. Oh, I, can't, I can't pronounce that right. Anyway, here's my classification report. As you can see, my recall for down and warning definitely increased from the, from the previous one. Just to just show you pretty quickly here. So my original one, my original recall for down and warning was 63 uh, and 68 overall. It definitely increased with this one going to 71 and 70. And uh, what else increased? Probably my one score by two points. Um, this, job, this, this model did a better job predicting down in the mornings. And just here seeing the ROC curve, it definitely increased the, the area under the curve by maybe four points, I believe. And just here I'm showing the importance of, of each uh, label. It seems that uh, X and Y are very important and Bender 1 and 3 made a big impact. So with that said, my next steps will be to uh, oversample the minority class just to see how uh, big difference it would make. And I tried to download a package, but uh, it was a complete failure because my kernel kept crashing. But definitely that will be my next step for this, for this, uh, for this project. And then I will use the cross validation to get the best recall rate from the logistic regression in random forest. Uh, for further analysis, I will use all three classes in the random forest and then compare that with the multi-class classification model. I would also uh, try to use the survival analysis to analyze the time it will take for an ESP to go from warning to down. And I know that Python offers a really awesome package called Life Lifelines. And with all of that, um, I would definitely would like to ask uh, any of you guys, what could you have done differently or what I did wrong in my, in my process here? I think uh, the oversample will improve uh, the score. Yeah, over, for yeah. the score, yeah, I thought so as well. So that's definitely wanna, something I want to do. Mm -hmm. I think the cross-validation cross -validation cross -validation will also. help you. Okay. I'm not sure if you spend time looking at traditional features you know, to think about what are the features that will help you improve your downtime. Okay. Like, right now you spend a lot of time thinking about overall features of the model, but are there features specifically designed for downtime? Okay. You know, what makes it? What, what are the ones that make more impact for a downtime? Correct. Correct. So what are those features? If okay. Like, are there are features in there that. Okay. Uh, and uh, overall, the data does not look like it has a lot of uh, uh, missing values. Mm -hmm. uh, you already, already have a lot of values. Mm -hmm. I like your winning strategy. You can do a little bit winning, winning strategy. That's a good job. And, uh, what if you remove those outliers? You think it will make a big impact? Maybe. Okay. Even though it's part of the data set, will you remove them just to yeah, see? I mean, does that robust scalar help, like, that if there is an outlier in your testing data, will it predict the outliers properly, or what would happen? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. so if I use a different uh, uh, scalar for my for the logistic regression, it will definitely have, diff it definitely showed a difference of the coefficients here, so... Um, Do you have increased your accuracy on the downtime? Did it increase? Uh, like you were, that's your goal, It was right? pretty much the same. Well, it was pretty much the same for the accuracy. I didn't, I didn't really check up. I didn't go into the classification. No, I was part. asking, do you want to increase your accuracy more for the downtime? Then, yes, yes. Then yes. I think you can increase that threshold from 0 0.54 to a little bit more and get more accuracy there and oversample perhaps. Oversample. I will vote for that. Yeah, definitely. So hyperparameter tuning, yeah, consolidation yeah. search. Uh, more features for down, down stuff. Uh, you got you got a little bit of uh, opportunity there to, to come and try. Okay. But overall, I think uh, good yeah, work. Thank you.